Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Walid Alskaf, and I'm the founder of Introblocks. Introblocks is both a podcast and a boutique consultancy firm focused on digital technologies such as blockchain. Whilst preparing a podcast on how blockchain can be used to help reach the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, I came across an article written by Ralph Chami, Assistant Director at the IMF, where he built a sophisticated valuation model on the services provided by what I call living assets, such as elephants and whales. Today, the markets that exist only value nature when it's dead. An elephant's tusks is worth $40,000, whilst a whale's meat is worth $50,000. What Ralph has done is taken the scientific data that is out there and transformed it in monetary terms by looking at the services rendered by living assets in terms of carbon capture and carbon sequestration, for which a market exists today. It's called the carbon exchange market. The staggering results of that analysis is that an elephant is worth $1.75 million, and a great whale is worth $2 million. This valuation is simply based from the services they perform in carbon capture and carbon sequestration throughout their lifetime. For me, that was personally, personally very eye-opening. Now, we're all aware of the defining moment we are finding ourselves in, in terms of climate change crisis. Every day, we regularly see the staggering numbers coming out in the press. And David Attenborough's latest documentary just emphasizes this further. What is clear is that in spite of the valiant effort by so many to change this, from conservationists to scientists and tree-hugging hipsters and so on, it simply hasn't worked. Pulling at our heartstrings creates a temporary reaction at best. What we need is a paradigm shift in our economy where we can create a sustainable market that values, protects, and, gen and regenerates living assets. In this webinar, we're gonna present to you what this market can look like, how to provide an opportunity for enterprises to offset their carbon emissions, to living assets, such as an elephant, where the funds used to buy the carbon capture and carbon sequestration done by that elephant is provided to local communities to sustain and protect it. If you think about it, $1.75 million over an elephant's 60 years lifespan is roughly equal to $80 a day. $80 a day to communities who usually live on under a dollar a day provides employment opportunities and micro-investments to help those local communities reach financial inclusion and raise their living standards. So imagine what a whole tribe of elephants can do to a local community. In essence, we are linking the economic development of those communities to that living asset, to that elephant. Nature is protecting them and helping them to strive. What we're talking about here is a win-win for all parties, from enterprises offsetting their carbon emissions with the knowledge and comfort that the funds are used to help raise living standards of those communities, to a regenerative elephant population, and finally, to a thriving local community. All this powered in a transparent, accountable, immutable, and, trans and traceable manner with blockchain technology. That is our vision. And that is here what we're here to talk to you through. So to start it off, it is with great pleasure that I will introduce you to Ralph Chami, Assistant Director at the IMF, who will walk you through his valuation model and his vision. Then you'll hear from David Katz, who will explain to you how he built his innovative circular economy for the plastic bank and the learnings from it that is applicable to this initiative. Followed by Geneviève Leveille, who will talk about creating market incentives and how to stimulate local communities' development. 
We will take questions at the end of the webinar and we will open up the platform for further discussions. But for now, Ralph, the mic is yours. Thank you, Ali. Can you hear me? I hope you can hear me and I hope you can, uh, it's more important than actually seeing me. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's wonderful to be here with jean pierre and David and with all of you to talk about what I think, um, before I talk about the valuation, about what I'd like to describe as the new paradigm, the new vision. So let me start with the vision. The, let's start with the kind of the end of the story, of this story, and then work through why the valuation is important. <clears throat> so what I really want to talk about, what I want to describe to you is what I call the new paradigm, a new way of thinking, a new way of behaving, that has in its core, in its DNA, nature. The, the claim, the proposition that I will make is that the new paradigm, economic financial paradigm, where nature is our partner, will deliver for us economic growth that is not only great or fantastic, but it's also inclusive and sustainable. And before I get into how to do so, because I need to make that case, at least briefly uh, right now, is what I want to, to contrast this with our reality. I mean, look at me right now, cowered in my in my house, what, talking to all of you through a screen, okay, hiding from a virus that you can't see, that presumably started in a local wet market that you and I would never visit. This virus has brought the whole world to a standstill. As of today, the world has lost four point, over 4% of, it, of the world GDP by the end of this year, trillions of dollars in losses, and most importantly, over a million people that have died from this. This is what happens when, with this current paradigm, which I, which I believe myself is bankrupt. This current paradigm that has caused us to live outside of the natural world, the belief that nature is, is gonna always be there, that nature is infinite, that we are separate from nature. So the paradigm that I want to describe to you today is where we, we come back to our roots, where we live with nature, and as a result, we partner with nature for the betterment of humanity. Now, I need to make the case for that, and the case starts with facts. What is it that we know? These are just examples because I can't cover all the science. Science tells us, let's start in the oceans, which are four-fifths of the planet. Science tells us that the oceans are not only four-fifths of the planet, but NASA on their website called the, the oceans the lungs of the planet. In particular, the phytoplankton that cover the waters absorb about 30 to 40 percent of the carbon dioxide emissions, and they, in return, return to us, return to the world over 50 percent of all the oxygen in the world. That means every other breath that you and I take, we should be thanking the oceans and the phytoplankton for that. In these oceans live all kinds of wonderful creatures. I particularly use the case of the whales, and in particular, the great whales. And the great whales capture, it turns out the science tells us that great whales and whales in general capture tremendous amounts of carbons on their body and indirectly through their fertilization of the phytoplankton. That's what the science says. The science there also tells us that their cousins on land, the elephants, if you like, Turns out that they're not only something for us to go and visit whenever we go on safari, but they actually are doing something that is incredible for humanity. The science also tells us that those elephants are capturing, helping to capture carbon, not only on their body, but they're moving through the forests. And I'm talking about even the elephants in the forests of Africa. These are the elephants that you and I never get to see. These are not the savanna elephants. These are the ones doing the work quietly in the background, helping us to survive by sequestering, helping trees sequester carbon in their bodies and in their roots. So by moving around the forest, they, they, they walk on all of these small shoots, allowing the older trees to grow. And it's the older trees that actually capture carbon. So that's what the science tells us. But now how do you go from the science to talking about economies? Well, I, I need to, to, to take that knowledge as Walid said, and transfer it into the language of the economy. We live in market economies where price is everything. Okay, most recently, in the ex-governor of, uh, of the Bank of England, Mr. Carney said, it seems that the price of everything is the value of everything. So we need to establish a price in order to have value, even though that we know 
that these assets in the word in the language of finance or these natural these creatures these wonderful creatures have been doing tremendous value for us we need unfortunately in our in our market economy to assign a price so when we look at the value of what the elephant of oh, let's take the whales for example the whales capture carbon there's a market for carbon so we can look at the whale over its lifetime and figure out how much carbon does a whale capture the whales also turns out to be when they are thriving and doing well the fisheries turn out to be thriving and doing well so we can look at their impact on fisheries and we can look at their impact on on whale tourism when you put up all of that value together you over its lifetime, you discount it to the present using standard financial techniques, you come up with the value of, of a whale of 2 million. Minimum, because that's the price of carbon today. And as we know, the Armageddon, the day of reckoning is, is, up, is closing in. So the price of carbon is only going to go up, which means the value of this natural asset is only going to appreciate. We can do the same thing for the elephants as well. Lead said, this is only in carbon sequestration. I'm not even talking about tourism. All the other things that the elephants and the whales and all of the creatures on this planet do for us, it's just in carbon sequestration alone, the elephants are worth $1.7 million. Okay, again, both the whales, if you like, if you like to visualize it differently, the elephants and the whales, each, each elephant, each whale capture carbon equivalent to thousands and thousands of trees. So now you have the science and you have the valuation. The question is, I still need to make the case for how we're going to build an economy around this. In order to do so, the first thing is the recognition of their value. Once you have a price, you can now say, well, they're valuable to the market economy. Then if they're valuable, then we need to enshrine that in the law. So we need policy. We need a policy that comes from the from the countries in which these these natural capital exists or a agreement among the countries where these natural assets may move back and forth to say these are valuable to the countries to the local communities in which they are and uh, and to the rest of the humanity and their value is x dollars because once you do that once we do that then the markets start to take you seriously. For example, there's a, already an example of it in New Zealand where they conferred personhood on rivers and they also declare that all animals are sentient beings. That means they have a mind, they have feelings, and we have, a, we have responsibilities and obligations towards them. By assigning a value, okay, you're now in the language, I'm a financial economist, then I start to think, well, this is a natural asset, Maybe, I can, maybe it can be a collateral, but for collateral, you need to define the property rights because that's how the markets start to th take this seriously. And you need to monitor the wealth and the health and, 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 and well-being of these assets. Once we do that, then we need to put in place a system of penalties, meaning if you do harm for them by accident or on purpose, there's a penalty to, to be paid. The penalty is not because you want to make money off of it. It's only a sense, it's a sense of a commitment on the part of the government that we take this very seriously. Then the markets start to take this action seriously because once you have, you have the science, you have the valuation, you have the policy, you have the law, and the asset is well-defined, then the markets will look at this, okay, maybe I can make a market off of this. And the easiest thing that comes about is insurance because insurance companies would want to get into this, say, well, the probability of a ship hitting a whale in the high seas is, is really minuscule. Perhaps we can insure this against such an accident. But once you have the, the private sector coming in in partnership with the, with, the, with the public sector, then you're talking about a PPP, this is, you know, and then you're talking about innovations that the markets would innovate in order to, in order to you know, sort of create markets in these natural assets but it's markets about what Walid said, a regenerative nature. It's markets about life. And we move away from the old bankrupt paradigm of the extractive view of nature, meaning we only take, we only value things that are dead. We don't value them when they're alive. Once you have that, then the next thing is the local community, the impact on the local community is very important because the sustainability of any effort hinges on the last person there looking at the elephant thinking, well, the tourists are not coming. I mean, just imagine now in Africa, in countries that depend on tourism for the elephants, the tourists are coming because of COVID. 
and I need money, I need to survive. You really don't want the guard to become a poacher because nobody strives to be a poacher. A poaching is the last last effort by someone who's starving, wants to make, wants to bring food to their families and they unfortunately take a life of a beautiful creature. So we need to aspire for something much better than that. And that's how we do this by, by in the case of the elephants, if you like, you have the law that says this is an asset, it has a value of 1.75 million and it's protected. And the, and the private sector comes in the, the government can actually use the value of the elephants on their balance sheet because that's what we call the value of the natural asset, just a, a natural capital, if you like. It becomes a capital on the balance sheet of countries. They can use that to engage in debt for nature swaps. They can use it to draw down their debt, they, to negotiate swaps of all kinds. Okay? And the private sector can think of services around the, the elephants to keep them alive to actually thrive because the more they thrive, the greater their numbers, the greater the numbers, the greater is the benefit. And the local communities can look at all of this and say, I can also make a decent living out of looking after these elephants. So, and by, and so you're talking about employment for the, for the local communities, therefore you get local ownership. There's also a role for the IFIs, the national financial institutions, they can come in and underwrite the residual risk that, that others are not willing to, to undertake or to absorb. So what I'm describing to you is a truly a new paradigm where nature is at the core of this paradigm and where we aspire for really economic growth that is meaningful, that is sustainable, and that is inclusive. And everybody, what Walid was saying, it's really a win-win model because this is a new treasure. This is a new treasure that if you look after can only grow over time. And let me stop here. Thank you. Buddy. Excellent. No, thank you so much, Ralph. Um, now I'd like to invite um, David Katz, uh, CEO and founder of the Plastic Bank, to walk us through you know, how you created your circular economy. Uh, David, uh, you've got the mic. Well, Lee, thank you very much. And good morning from uh, wonderful, beautiful fall Vancouver. There's a conversation in circularity that I think needs to be moved forward. And I don't know if circularity really says it well enough. I think the natural ecosystem is more of a web, an interconnectedness of them all. Many think that one has to happen before it transitions to the next phase. These diagrams we see that show circles, but it is much more interconnected. I can only use my living example, and that is of the Plastic Bank, an organization that came to life May the 11th, 2013, that I've been in the continuous execution of the Plastic Bank. It's best exemplified as a global chain of stores for the poor, for the ultra poor, those under the dollar ninety a day, where everything in the store can be purchased using plastic garbage. And we offer everything from school tuition to medical insurance, Wi-Fi, cooking fuel, cell phone minutes, everything the poor truly need, want, but can't truly afford. Using garbage that would otherwise be flowing into the ocean and natural environment. Truly a chain of stores that provides an opportunity for the world to collect and use materials as money. All the material we collect, we offer to great organizations like Henkel or SC Johnson or Hugo Boss, other ones that use that material into their packaging, ultimately connecting the consumer, allowing the consumer an opportunity to use them in that package whenever they buy a bottle of Mr. Muscle, a bottle of Windex, uh, something from Hugo Boss, they're in fact actually helping extract material from ocean-bound waterways and helping lift poverty at the same time. It's truly wind to the sixth power. Win, 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 win. Even the plastic wins, it becomes new again. To exhibit the web, 
I use this example. You see, when, when the plastic wins, of course, the environment wins. When the plastic has won, our brands win, the customer wins, then the consumer wins. When the plastic wins, we win. If the environment wins, then of course the plastic had to win. If the environment won, of course the brand won, we won. You see, we can't exist without this win, win or no deal paradigm. What occurs in win to the sixth power truly is exponentiality, not linear, which I think is exhibited in a circular model, but exponentiality where in that synergistic model, when the brand wins and we win, the world benefits a hundredfold or more. When we all win, even more power has been created in the world. It's not that I win and they win, but it's as a result of us winning, everyone else wins simultaneously. Inside of all of everything that we do, we've created a blockchain-based banking application that transacts that material, that provides a space, a digital space of inclusion as well. So when the material is transacted, when one of our collectors, like let's say Lisa in Port-au-Prince returns her material to a collection center, She's identified in the banking application. She has an application. The center has an application. She makes a deposit like she wanted to tell her. The volume of material is weighed or the mass of the material is weighed and a value is transferred into her online digital bank account. She's kept safe from robbery and from having her husband drink the money or whatever may occur. That transparency is shared with the world as well given the opportunity, but I think more importantly, in the digitization, the more frequently that Lisa returns the material, the higher the quality of the material, the higher the quality of interaction and the social circle that she invites, she gets to earn a credit rating, a worthiness. Because we know the volume of material that she's bringing, the value of that, and we know what she's done consistently. She has the ability to earn or substantiate what her debt service may be, providing an opportunity for the world to borrow low interest rate loans, substantiated through their actions and stewardship over the environment. True inclusion. You see one yet additional way of exponentiality. How am I am now multiply the true value inherent in that plastic? In this interconnected web, when our collectors can return material for inclusion into education, like within Haiti where the government can't afford or doesn't provide schooling, the local population pays roughly $20 per month to have their child to attend a school. Very basic. There's over 200,000 children in Haiti currently that don't have access to education. And now the family has an opportunity to return the material they encounter to the school as payment for education. You see, in that exponential web, the family doesn't look at the packaging as packaging. They don't look at it as a bottle. The paradigm doesn't even have them look at the bottle as the $20 per month that it will help alleviate. The paradigm of that material now is the end of poverty. You see, that's an exponentiality. Because in the end of poverty, it provides hope. It provides a clear thinking. It provides now the ability to think of others. I can't tell you how many people I've encountered that have communicated with me that now as a result of the program, they can see their children going to university. Well, that and that family ended poverty. In my interaction with that family, they saw the world newly. 
the ability to now contribute. You see, there is much more than circularity. There is a beautiful interconnected web that connects us all. When we look for it, when we steward others, when we truly seek win-win or no deal, we unlock the unlimited potential of the exponentiality or the unlimited potential of the universe. The infinite space that we live in is available when we look for it. And we have the power to create inside of that. And a new form of business is emerging, a regenerative business model, the regenerative economy. We're doing business doesn't just do less harm than it did the last year of what sustainability is communicated, but a business model that repairs the damage that's been done. And in this web, in this connection of the exponential, that's what is available. So thank you, Waleed, and I'll pass it on to you again. Thank you, David, for a wonderful presentation. It, it, it was awesome, like uh, I knew it would be. Okay, now I'm going to invite uh, Geneviève uh, Levey to, to the scene. If you could introduce yourself, give us a little bit of information on Angry Ledger, but also how we can create those market incentives and how we can help local populations you know, reach you know, sustainable development. It's over to you, Geneviève. Thank you very much. Uh, I am trying to come down from the height that have been put by both David and by Ralph. And I hope to do them justice. So I'm jean Vievre and I'm the CEO of AgriLedger. AgriLedger is a platform based on the blockchain technology that has been used uh, for the last six months now in Haiti and working with smallholder farmers in the fresh fruit industry. So for me, I don't think we need to look very far in this world. And we have foods which are very much food self-sufficient. Other countries, they really need to import food to need to feed their nation. While some countries import food because they want to extend their choices, others are bringing in basic food for necessity. If not, the people would starve. Often it's those countries that rely on food imports to survive and they pay a high price for survival. High costs of import, higher taxes, and all these things put the countries in deeper debt. In some part of the world, including Haiti, which is the country of my birth, many factors over the centuries have affected the ability to provide for its people. You've had the trials of domination by outside culture, land devastated by wild storm and widespread flooding, international indebtedness, and political unrest from mismanaged resources and corrupt governance. You have producers accepting prices for their products who are too low to keep food on their own table because access to information and money to support the process of harvest and access to wider market is rather limited. This is a common story and it is one that has had far too many million of the world people in the world in many of the ones of the countries that Ralph speaks about. There are two simple outcomes to support equity and transparency in the world market. It is the creation of inclusive economy in a rural ecosystem, bringing technology advances and better infrastructure to rural areas to food producers. This way, the food producer family can participate in the wider com community, share knowledge, gain access to markets, and upward mobility. Now, these are things that can be seen already with some of the work that we've been done. When you have an influx of cash into a community, you need not tell them what they should do with it. We as human want to survive. What they want to do is send their children to school and do better for themselves. And what is also very important, and from what I took away from Mr. Uh, Sir Attenborough's program, is we have gotten to where we're overproducing food. We are stepping us over ourselves to try and make sure that we have, we can get the best prices. We need to get back to basic. 
And getting back to basic to me is really some of what was brought on by Ralph and also creating these non, I would say, non-conformatist banking, such as what Plastic Bank has, has done. I would like to challenge how, and this is one of the call of the action to action that has been brought by Wallet, how can we take ourselves together, bring in the answers and create this microcosm whereby we allow everyone the opportunity to be prosperous. And when I mean prosperous, does not mean rich. And also what we have to think about is that even we, if we look at what COVID is doing, are finding that our communities are now suffering from lack of proper caloric. Um, reading us, you know, it was great to see that the World Food Program had won the Nobel Prize recently. But it's scary what they talk about. They talk about that due to COVID, they're expecting 265 million individuals to join the the league of hunger or uh, calorie deprived. And that is really something that we need to see how we can turn it. Now, I'd like to suggest that as Wally said, when you have $80 a day and you can invest that in a community, that community will figure out, and this is not really about us telling them what to do with it. And it is giving them the digital tools, the digital access to be able to expand on that. And even if it just brings it back to zero. To me, it's important because then we will have that carbon that we are hearing is causing us to destroy the, the planet. It was very interesting. I don't know many of you have had the opportunity to watch that show, but it was scary to see in 30 years what percentage decrease we've had and wondering how we can get that back. So for me, it's really about bringing the challenge. We have, we live in a distributed world and now we have technology which allows us to be able to create better trust, to create mechanism to communicate with each other. And hopefully, I hope also give us the ability to enjoy our lives a, a bit more. So um, my call to action is let's all come together and try and figure out how not only do we keep our planet safe but we even allow all of us to be able to continue to prosper and eat as we should thanks <laughs> thank you very much uh genevieve so i'm gonna invite um ralph and david um back onto the stream so welcome back and thank you very much, you know, all three of you for, for delivering excellent uh, speeches. Um, and now I would like to open uh, the session up to uh, uh, questions. So we've seen uh, a number of questions come up um, within the comment sections on LinkedIn. So if, if you want to ask your question, now is the right time. Um, so perhaps I'm going to start with one let me find it <laughs> from uh, Rory Unsworth. Uh, just bear with me. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Okay, um, so there we go. Okay, so the question is, um, what is the value add of this type of sustainable investment versus others? How will we convince businesses to change the way they currently buy carbon credits? Um, Ralph, <laughs> you're nodding your head. Do you, do you want to have a, a go at it? Sure. Uh, it's not as difficult as, as one thinks. So let's, let's, uh, let's take an example, okay? Um, let's take a business, I'm not going to name names, that has a uh, carbon footprint of 100, 100 tons per year. And uh, by the way, just to let you know that there's a, there's a global movement now to hold businesses accountable regarding their footprint, carbon footprint, okay? So in, in terms of the natural assets that I'm talking about, natural capital assets, one could say, all right, suppose the economy that I'm talking about, let's focus on the elephants. 
we get the we get the country to declare the elephants as assets and they have a value of 1.76 million by the way one elephant can capture carbon in its in its work in, on its body and in terms of the impact on on the forest equivalent to about you know 2000 over 2200 trees just one elephant okay so so uh, right now if you want that company that is polluting to offset its its carbon footprint how would you do so what is what are the available technologies that exist out there the only thing that i know of in, that, in terms of nature based solution is planting trees right well what's the difference here here is looking at the elephant which is one elephant is equivalent to 2200 trees in terms of the carbon sequestration so the 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 company that is of that is producing so much carbon could be asked you have now a menu of options rather than just investing in trees to offset your carbon footprint but now you also have access to elephants or whales or other types of natural nat nature based solutions that can offset your carbon footprint that will offset the flow now the question is how to get there is what i was describing in terms of you need the policy you need the legal framework you need the property right you need the definition of the collateral and all that would take is the let's say in the folk to focus on the elephants is the country in which the elephants exist for those countries to say we recognize the elephants as a natural capital as an asset that we're going to add to our balance sheet by the way uh, you know nature for debt swaps or debt for nature swap already exists since the 90s there's nothing new here it's just what we're adding to it is other types of nature based assets so we didn't know they were playing that role such as the elephants and the elephant and the and the whales by the way mangroves seagrass salt marshes coral reefs these are huge carbon sinks they exist and just imagine just if i may if i can pivot off of this well just to say Imagine all these countries that have all that wealth in their ocean, as David was saying, uh, John Vieb is, 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 was alluding to, they're sitting on wealth beyond the imagination. And that is wealth that is not extractive. That's not pulling oil out of the, of the land, pulling gold out of mining for gold, mining for copper, okay, one time, and destroying everything in its way. This is about keeping everything in the ocean, in the land, seeing it grow and seeing your own wealth and your own health and the health of this planet and all creatures big and small humans and non-human thrive thank you ralph so we now have a, another question from bridget greenwood um so this all sounds incredibly positive to me how do we get adoption at scale from embracing the thinking and put it into a practice what are the most impactful next steps um, I don't know, um, David or Genevieve, if you want to talk from your experience, from, from, from the work you've done, um, what are the learnings that can be taken from there in terms of Bridget's question, please? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's very broad. I resonate on the question. I saw it come up and it took me a moment to, to really be in the contemplation of it. Now, 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 now for us, we, you know, for us, it's a sales team. For us, it's building a business. I mean, we are trying to work against the traditional forces of shareholder return first. I mean, we're working within and against the business paradigm that has returned us here. Much of the degradation we see in the environment is coming from those few trying to extract maximum value for themselves. Now we have to play in that paradigm. We have to understand that we have to create a new way of thinking that also returns shareholder return while creating broad societal and environmental impact. Now for us, I'll speak from a business. Mass adoption will come from me building an organization that has a multinational sales force that goes out to engage those organizations that want to participate in buying the material and providing um, you know, collection credits for the world that provides an incentive to collect the material, it's business. And what will help that is your demand for it. Because we are now the most powerful consumer group that has ever existed. And you have the power. Maybe the question is, what can we, but what can you do to help support that? How are you vocal? How do you vote with what you buy? 
Because every time you buy something, you vote. If you buy degradation, that is what you're voting for because that is what will continue to be produced. If you buy stuff that is single use, if you buy things that degrade others, that's what's going to occur. So what can you do? That's a broad question. How can you influence others? How can you stand forward, use your word to invite others into a new way of thinking? That's what has to occur. Don't look outside for others to do this. We need you to stand forward and make change. Thank you, David. Geneviève, do you want to add a, a few points to that? <laughs> Not after this. Actually, that next one is uh, is targeted to to Raoul, which is you know um, in your excellent presentation, you briefly mentioned the use of insurance. How do you envisage um, insurance will be relevant, and what is the risk that it that is being insured? Fantastic. So, so uh, you know, um, uh, Chile. Let me give you an example. Uh, Chile has embarked on a national project uh, called the Blue Boat Initiative, and the idea is to protect the ocean of Chile, which has, which has, which is incredible and has some of the most important whales that that exist. They are the blue whales the Chilean blue whales. And the idea behind it is to protect them and allow that ocean to, you know, ocean life to, to grow and, and be more vibrant. So let's let's take that example and, and go go to Chile. I mean I could do it with the elephants too, but let's change for the for the whales for a minute. So what Chile could do is basically say those those whales, because by the way, most of these blue whales stay for 98% of the time in the Chilean waters because of the long coast of Chile. Okay? So we know they're there 98% of the time most of the time. So the government says, well, we're going to declare the, the, uh, the, the whales as a natural asset. The, and, and not only that, they're just like New Zealand, they're sentient beings, and we're going to confer personhood on them. Meaning if you were to injure them by accident or on purpose, the value, of, you, there, could be, there could be criminal charges, but certainly there's a monetary charge of $2 million per whale. By the way, we did value, there's our papers out, it's a scientific paper, you can download it, it's in the public domain, we put all the mathematics there for everyone to, to get, and where we show you the technique of how we, how we valued the Chilean whale, which is actually even more precious than $2 million, if you like, in terms of uh, dollar value. But let's go back to this. So now what happens? Insurance companies will come in because the tanker doesn't want to hit a whale because if they were to hit a whale, then there's most likely they will be found out. So what the Chileans, as I understand the Blue Boat Initiative to be doing, they're trying to put bow, uh, buoys, acoustic buoys in the water that would uh, have the ability with satellite technology to actually figure out what kind of whale is in the water, what kind of creatures in the water. So those buoys in the water have the acoustics. They, they, they understand, they can visualize what kind of whale and the, the satellite would actually has the, the ability to discern, you know, they, they transmit the data, the satellite has the software that figures out where, where, the, where these are and what kind of uh, 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 whales are in the water. Now imagine if the ship that is sailing has a technology to receive that information. Okay, that, that ship now is saying, okay, I'm sailing, I'm told that there's a blue whale in the vicinity of where I'm going. So either I move, okay, I move just few degrees to avoid because whales are like elephants, they're creatures of habit. They say they use migratory routes that are well known. So we know where they are, we know what types they are, whether it's whales or dolphins, whatever have you. Anyway, so but there's a probability that you may hit the whale, but it's really very small. This is where the insurance comes in. All right. I used to be professor of finance in my other, other life, and I used to teach insurance theory, right? So what happens is insurance companies come in and they look at the hazard rate because the probability and say, we'll insure you, the owner of the tanker, in case you were to hit the whale. But if you were to install that device on your ship, we would reduce the premium for you. Why? Because that, that device on the ship would keep you from hitting the whale. After all, all of us own cars, and we all have alarm systems on our cars. Why do you have an alarm system on your car? It's not to protect you, it's to protect the insurance company. Because in case there's a theft, the insurance company has to indemnify you. As a result, they, 
the alarm system on the car is to reduce the probability so they don't have to pay. So that's what you do. But so what's happening is the insurance companies come in and they insure the asset itself. Okay. Even the government itself can provide that insurance. The government that is telling you, if you were to hit my whale, you're going to pay PayPal, could also sell insurance and say, if you were, because the probability by accident, that, that revenue from that insurance can be used to look after the, the, the health and wealth of the whales themselves, of the marine ocean itself. So that's what David, you know, and Javier talked about the circularity you bring back into the nature. You allow the nature to rejuvenate, to regenerate. And by the way, you know, if you're thinking innovation, all these young, uh, you know, uh, uh, very smart kids who come up with all these innovations, they can figure out all kinds of ways that you can figure out, you know, where the, the whales are and, 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 and how to avoid them. But you're bringing breath, you're bringing business into the, into the world of protecting and growing nature, allowing nature. It's protecting and growing life, not the business of extracting. Because right now, the only value fish is when it's dead on your plate, served to you in a restaurant for 30 bucks. That's the only time we put a value on a fish. That, right now, if you hit a whale right now, okay, ships come into port and the whale is skewered on its bow. What penalty does it pay? Nothing. Although it has value, so I go to Carney's statement, price of everything seems to be the value of everything, but the whale is valuable. So how can it have a price of zero? Something is amiss in our economic paradigm. Yeah, there Something is, is amiss. True. You know, we'll lead, when it comes to insurance, you know, we use insurance as well within our model because there's, there's an underwriting of that risk, a share risk. So like within Haiti, we provide um, an illness insurance to our collectors. It's an illness insurance that number one has never been in the paradigm of our collector community. And for, for a mother who can then write an insurance policy against her husband in the event that he is injured at work. So if something happens to him and she's the housewife, He's injured. If say he can't work, they're left destitute. But now she has the ability to name herself as a beneficiary on a policy against her husband. So if something happens to him, she's taken care of and the family's taken care of. It even has a 30,000 to one death benefit. So if he's killed, forbid, 24,000 to one. So she has a sense of security. You see, for us, insurance for us is the exponential value, like school tuition providing a hope of end of poverty. Insurance provides a hope of end of suffering. It's 80 cents a month to provide illness insurance, a very good policy to the poor. 80 cents. It takes very little material to collect it. Now, for our collector communities, something that would have never been available before. So for them, tremendous value, which ultimately is transferred into the material. The plastic now is revealed as powerful to engage more and more people. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for both of your contributions. And just uh, one final point, Peter, you may be aware of InsureWave, which is a marine insurance blockchain solution, how that can be tailored also to, to incentivize ships to avoid hitting a migration pass of whales. I'd, I'd like to move on now to another question from Alexander Boshi, and I'm gonna send it over to, to you, uh, Geneviève. Uh, the circular economy is one of the business targets for a lot of Brazilian companies. Considering the benefits that it can give us, there is another opportunity to get money back through tax saves. In your point of view, it can push the implementation and how blockchain can support the circular economy on a supply chain management side. Sure. Uh, so for me, I've actually started talking about, let's not talk supply, let's talk value chain. So, but when you start looking at things from through the lens of value chain, you realize the input and output to everyone. So in the situation of what we have designed in Haiti, the producer is as accountable for the quality. So he, this is part of the education if you take something from the tree before it's mature, you've lost the opportunity cost. So if he, he or she understands the opportunity cost, then they will take care. Also, the other thing is that incentives have been put in 
to allow the transportation, the transformation to be accountable for the goods wherein they are in their possession. So what blockchain has allowed us to do is to retain, so really use this aspect of escrowing. So I have goods and I escrow it to you for transportation, to you for selling. But at the end, now if we get back to financials, it is really cost accounting. You take out the cost of doing business and then whatever is left comes back to the producer. Now, that doesn't mean that 50% will come back. It will depend what is the route of that transformation. If that transformation is much more expensive, then it goes to say that there is less profit to be made. So now, this is where blockchain comes in in a very great way, is to keep track and to measure. It even allows you to also have these uh, sort of contracts which are created. So someone may say, I get paid per piece, per per kilo, per whatever. Someone else will say, I get a percentage. So based on those things, you get everyone acting almost like a hot potato. If you drop it, not only will I lose, but you will also lose. So therefore, we all lose. That is a collaboration. Now, what has also happened is that you get greater distribution of that wealth across the community. You start creating solutions as a community to support the work that needs to be done. Efficiencies are not imposed. Efficiencies are created. So what I I didn't talk about earlier is with the work that we did in Haiti around the mango during what I would consider one of the most difficult time um, to try to implement any kind of technology was to show that you could now get the bulk, 68% of the revenue, back to Gourmand, which is in the middle of nowhere in the country, which then means that 58 individuals partook into the, this wealth, and they will spread it. Because unlike in the West, where you might be having an account or you might take vacation, they don't have vacation. They get their community back in. They don't want to be living in the city. They'd rather be. No, we want to stay where our families are. I don't know about you guys. I'm missing my family. I just want to be close to them, love them, hate them. So taking that aspect, if you can now, what the blockchain technology allows you to do is, in my world, collect data to inform others. So I see blockchain as part of the infrastructure, then you start bringing in digital identity, mobile technology, all these things to create information. So very much so being able to measure and change at will what is necessary. Thank you. No, thank you so much, NPF. Um, we've got about five minutes uh, left before the end uh, of this webinar. And I really want to make a call out you know, to all of you. This is you know, initiative, which is way bigger than any one of us. You know, it is about fundamentally changing our system of values from valuing nature as dead. You know, we chop off a tree, it's wood. We, we kill a whale, it's meat. We kill an elephant, it's a tusk. To one where we actually reward, you know, the living services they're providing us on a daily level by creating this win-win kind of relationship that we've been talking about. Now, as I said, this is much bigger than any one of us. And we really want to be just a catalyst to get to a situation where we can actually build a pilot. Um, we're very lucky, and you'll see in the comments, uh, we have the famous conservationist, Ian Redman, who is part of this initiative um, also, who is helping us uh, to make this into a real functioning pilot. But we need your help. We, we, we're going to create a number of working groups, you know, a science working group to identify new living assets, such as, you know, elephants, whales, gorillas, you, you name it. We're going to set up, you know, an economic economist working group, like, you know, what Ralph has done, which is to translate the scientific data in terms of monetary terms. We're going to be setting up a legal regulatory working group to identify what are the uh, legal rights those animals have, depending on which jurisdiction they're in a tech working group to be able to monitor the health, the well-being of those animals and how that integrates within uh, the blockchain system. We're going to need also, of course, 
an ethics working group to act as our moral compass, you know, for this initiative. And we would love for you, you know, to be part of it. So, you know, email me, DM me, or just connect and, and reach out and let's have this conversation. If your firms are, are looking at how to offset their carbon emissions and they want to hit carbon neutrality, you know, again, this is an initiative that provides transparency, traceability, and accountability through the blockchain system. And we would love to have this conversation. So um, we've got just three more minutes. Um, Geneviève, uh, Ralph, um, David, I don't know if you have any concluding uh, statements that you'd like to make. <laughs> I have one. I'd like to thank you, Walid, for bringing us all together. Pleasure. With this. Uh, I mean, the there are so many of us going in very many directions. And I think being able to forge in the right way is something that you bring. It's always been a pleasure to hear some of these conversations that you've brought us. And now you're, the call to action is one that I definitely want to be part of. And thank you for that. Thank you, Geneviève. <laughs> I'd like to add my voice to that of Geneviève um, and to tell everyone exactly what you're saying, what we're all saying, which is we can do this. Yes. We need tomorrow to be different than today and yesterday. Okay, it's a, and, and we are at a great moment in history. We have the technology, we have the science, we have, we have, we people are sensing that we need something different. The vision is here, the plan is here. Please join us. Yes. I, I think we'll lead, I think if anyone here has an idea or a thought, I wanna pose, I wanna pose a new thinking. And in your thought, is it against the laws of physics? If it's not against the laws of physics, it's possible. It's just thinking that makes it so. Nothing that this panel or anyone here is talking about is against the laws of physics. It's creativity, fortitude, and the decision to begin. Thank you. Thank you once again. Uh, for all the participants. And on a more personal note, I'd like to thank my wife, uh, Rihanna, for supporting me through this initiative. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank you all, you know, the participants, you know, for, for your great questions and your comments. This um, webinar is going to be uh, published, a video of it. Please share it as far uh, wide as you can. We want to get as many people you know, to be part of this conversation, to be part of this initiative, to, to create this regenerative nature and regenerative economy. And so please join us in this initiative. And But for now, we're going to wish you a good rest of your day or evening. Until next time. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye.